Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our June Fellows event. And we have two very eminent speakers to, uh, this evening to um, discuss health policy in nursing and uh, uh, from a local, national and international perspective. And I'll um, move on to introduce uh, Mr Howard Catton. Howard is the Chief Executive Officer at the Na International Council of Nurses, the ICN in Geneva. Prior to this role, Howard was the ICN's Director of Nursing Policy and Programmes and worked closely with the WHO uh, World Health Organization on several panels and working groups, leading delegations to the World Health Organization Executive Board and the World Health Assembly, managing workforce forums and developing key policy and position statements on safe staffing, retention and migrant health. Prior to joining the ICN, Howard worked for the Royal College of Nursing as a regional officer policy advisor and senior employment relations advisor prior to his appointment as head of policy and international affairs. So I'd welcome Howard to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Um, some faces who I recognize in the, in the audience. It's a very great pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you. Um, I bring greetings from someone who you will know, the ICN President uh, Annette uh, Kennedy. Uh, I was on the phone to her this morning as I was coming over. She was delighted that I was able to uh, be here this evening, um, put some pressure on that I needed to put in a good turn uh, to her home audience uh, for you. Um, but I feel as though I know Ireland uh, well over the years. I've, I've had the very great pleasure uh, to come over and to work with INMO, um, who, as you know, are the uh, association that's in membership of uh, IC, uh, ICN. Uh, we had Thomas uh, with us in uh, Geneva uh, recently as well, which was uh, fabulous to, to work with someone of Thomas's uh, quality uh, as well. Um, so I am very, very privileged and honoured to be invited to be with you uh, this evening. Um, I genuinely believe that this is a, a really unique moment of opportunity for the nursing profession globally. Uh, I know that before I went to Geneva, um, I was often frustrated uh, by the by the difficulties of trying to connect with a global health agenda, uh, by the fact that WHO often seemed to give quite a low profile and presence and importance uh, to the nursing profession. Uh, and I think that that is absolutely changing. Um, and that's not wishful thinking. I'm going to talk you through some of the evidence that I would bring for that change, for that opportunity that we have, uh, that we have now. Um, just for those of you who uh, are not familiar with ICN. Uh, ICN is the organization that's recognized by the World Health uh, Organization to speak on behalf of nursing. Uh, we have a special relationship, special status with WHO. What that means is that we can intervene, speak in debate, debates at the World uh, Health Assembly, for example. Um, I just come back as to some other people in the audience from having been part of a delegation of over 80 nurses that ICN put together to go and participate in the World uh, Health, uh, Health Assembly uh, this, uh, this, this May. Um, it also means that we're uh, frequently asked to identify expert nurses to support policy work and policy initiatives uh, that WHO, that are part of WHO's uh, strategic um, pri priorities. We're the oldest of the health organisations recognised by WHO. We were founded in 1899, which means that this is our 120th birthday uh, year. Uh, and our role, as well as to influence a global health agenda, is to advocate on behalf of nursing. Um, and we very deliberately focus our policy work on professional practice issues, on socioeconomic welfare and workforce, uh, and on uh, regulation 
uh, as, as well. But what we're trying to increasingly do is to align the nursing policy work with the global health agenda so that we clearly demonstrate that if you want to deliver on the global health priorities, you need to invest in uh, and have the support of the nursing and midwifery workforce. So nursing and midwifery we're trying to position as an enabler to addressing global health issues and global health challenges. Um, I said that this is a, a very unique time uh, and moment of opportunity for our, our, our profession and perhaps the most obvious uh, reason that you might be aware of for, um, for that is that WHO literally uh, something like 13 or 14 days ago, designated 2020 as the year of the nurse and the midwife. Uh, we've always had uh, uh, an international day of the nurse, the 12th of May. Uh, never before have we had a year where WHO has said that they want that year to recognise uh, nursing uh, and, and, and midwifery. Um, it comes on the back of... Uh, the launch of the Nursing Now campaign, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Just 18 months ago, uh, Lord Nigel Crisp, who you can see in the picture uh, on the left from the Duchess of Cambridge, um, launched the Nursing Now uh, campaign. The, the reason he, he launched that campaign was because it came on the back of a report uh, that he authored called the Triple Impact very simply, it was called the triple impact because it made the argument that when you invest in nursing, you invest in health improvement and health outcomes. Uh, but by investing in nursing, you also uh, it supports economic growth and development. And by investing in nursing, as an overwhelmingly female profession, you are also uh, investing in women and addressing uh, some of the gender inequalities that we run that we know run very deep in not just our health systems, but our societies as well. And that report came on the back of another report that the UN uh, had published called the high UN High Level Report on Health, Employment and Economic Growth. This was in 2014. But a central message of that report was also that investment in health was an investment in economic growth. It sought to change traditional thinking that, uh, invest, that, that, that health was a drag on economic growth. Investment in health was only something you could afford to do when the economy was booming and doing well. And it flipped that round uh, and made the argument for why investing in health will drive economic growth um, and, and prosperity. So, a year of the nurse, WHO recognition. WHO recognition also in the form of the first chief nursing officer at WHO to the right of the Duchess of Cambridge in the picture there. You can see Elizabeth Eero. Elizabeth was appointed uh, within two or three months after Dr. Tedros, uh, the Director General of WHO, was, uh, was elected. Um, we um, at ICN, when WHO were going through the process, of electing their new director general and Dr Tedros uh, is the gentleman uh, on the uh, in the right hand picture uh, we wrote to all of the candidates and said um, we would really like to know more about what your agenda is for WHO and what importance you attach to uh, nursing how would you support the nursing midwifery professions and we think that the underrepresentation at WHO has been uh, a significant weakness and we would like to know candidates whether you would appoint a chief nursing officer and Dr Tedros uh, wrote back uh, in very effusive terms uh, to commit his support to uh, to nursing and to say uh, yes I will appoint a chief nursing uh, chief nursing officer to be fair all of the other candidates said very positive things about nursing but as you know, when people get elected, you often hear arguments about, you know, I know I said that, but now I've actually seen what's going on in the organisation. It's a bit more difficult. Things have moved on. Don't have the money there. Ted Ross made the appointment of Elizabeth Aro within two or three months after he, was, uh, after he was elected. And having had the pleasure to, to meet with him and listen to him on a number of, uh, of, of, of occasions, um, uh, it also became very clear to me that the reason he 
did that wasn't just because ICN and other nursing organisations had said we'd like to see a chief nursing officer. He had seen the power and the difference that nursing had made when he had, when in his previous role he was a health minister in Ethiopia. He was the health minister who gave nurses prescribing rights around antiretrovirals, and he saw the difference that that made uh, for people with HIV and AIDS. Uh, so his commitment, I, I absolutely believe, is born out of having seen the transformative power of what nursing can do when you invest, uh, when, when you, when you invest in nursing. So these are, these are all big reasons as to why it's a, a moment of opportunity. But this, for me, is, is the biggest and the most important reason as to, as, as to why we have a year of the nurse and we have this opportunity. Uh, on the left hand side there I've just identified what the big global health challenges are at the moment. These are ICM priorities but these are also WHO priorities as well. The sustainable development goals, these are the 17 uh, targets that countries committed to that replace the Millennium Development Goals. There's one specifically on health but there are others in relation to poverty, education, housing, employment, um, climate uh, and, and water safety uh, as, as, as well. One of the things which is striking about those sustainable development goals is that yes you can see the obvious connection to nursing with SDG 3 on health but you don't have to dig very deep on the other SDGs to see how nursing is absolutely critical to and contributes to um, uh, the achievement of some of those other uh, goals. Universal health care coverage, only about half the people of the world have access to fundamental health services. I don't mean having uh, an acute DGH on, your, uh, on the corner of your street, I mean having access to uh, fundamental primary health care vaccinations, um, public health uh, advice uh, and, and, and information. Um, Public health, uh, big issue. Humanitarian crisis, whether they be the result of man-made uh, situations or natural uh, disasters. And obviously, uh, again, what we see common in memory countries is a genuine desire to try and put people at the centre of how health systems and health services are, uh, are, are organised and delivered uh, as, as, as well. You need, all of, you need people to deliver all of those and obviously that's where the human resource challenge uh, comes in. I'll say a little bit more about that. But when I look at those global health challenges, I see nursing work. This is what nurses do. There's shift away from medical, medicalisation and the medical perspective and approach to, to care. Um, and that for me is why the most important reason why this is a moment of opportunity uh, for us because that alignment between our profession and the global health agenda and honestly I sort of think that's why the WHO have designated 2020 as the year of the nurse and the, mid and the midwife because I think many of them get it that they know that they cannot deliver on WHO's strategic priorities and objectives without harnessing um, our profession um, uh, as, as an enabler to deliver, deliver on all of those, those things. Universal health care coverage, uh, you'll hear a lot of um, from the Director General from WHO, from the regional officers of WHO. It is the standout, it's the standout priority. But I include this slide because I think it's, it's, it's interesting in terms of how um, it, 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 you can see a, a reframing of the importance of health within this description of what universal health care coverage is. We know when universal health care coverage is achieved, it doesn't then say health will be improved. The first thing it says poverty will be reduced. So the first connection it makes to universal coverage is about reducing poverty. The second is about creating jobs and employment and that economies will grow. And then you get on to communities will be protected from disease. So yeah, it's, that's, that's the point at which you see a, a, a health connection. And then it talks about women's economic opportunities and the well-being and advancement of children uh, and family development as, as, as well. And I think that's a, it's a, a very deliberate reframing of the importance, the fundamental importance of health to our societies, our communities, our countries, our, our nations as, as well, beyond just a notion of being well or having a sense of well-being, but connecting to employment, economy, well-being, safety, uh, secu security. 
this picture you see on your left I took just uh, towards the end of last year and it was a, a huge poster uh, that was in the foyer of WHO um, uh, speaking to the importance of universal healthcare coverage. Um, but the reason I took the picture is because it, again it was striking for me that the image of the workers that they use to demonstrate um, how they were going to deliver on universal health coverage uh, was, uh, was nurses. Um, and this is a direct quote from Dr. Uh, Dr. Tedros from last year after he'd been uh, appointed. He said, there is no doubt in my mind that nurses are, a, are the linchpin of achieving the sustainable um, development goals. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a quote that I, that, that I like because you'll know that the, the linchpin literally uh, holds the axle on the wheel. So if you take the linchpin away, you're not going to move forward and the wheels literally will, will fall off. And, uh, and I quite like that in terms of the relationship of, of nursing to uh, achieving on the global health, uh, the, the, the health, health, health agenda. So what does ICN do? If that's, if that's a little bit about what the global health agenda uh, looks like and, and uh, some of WHO's recognition of the importance of nursing, what, what, does, what more does ICN bring, contribute? Um, how do we support, how do we try and support the work of WHO? Every year, uh, the 12th of May, is International Nurses Day, as you know, and ICN takes uh, a lead for setting the theme for International uh, Nurses Day, and we pr pr produce resources, uh, a publication, uh, posters, short videos, case, uh, case studies as well. Um, it, it's not mandatory for uh, countries or associations to pick up and run with those, but very, very many of them do and take a, a lead from, from what ICN do. For the last three years, we have very deliberately aligned our resources for International Nursing Day with the Global Health Agenda. Three years ago, our publication um, talked to nursing and the Sustainable Development Goals. These are all free and available to download from our website. Last year, we talked about nurses' human rights. This year, the publication is here, Nursing, Global Health and Delivering Universal Health Care Coverage. Um, and Annette Kennedy is there presenting the publication this year to, uh, to Dr. Dr. Tedros. What do we do within that, public, within that publication? Of, of course, uh, we describe the health challenges, some of the policy, uh, policy questions. But at the heart of the publication for the last three years, we have included real-life case studies of nursing practice from uh, around, uh, around the world. Um, I think... Um, uh, and it was a conversation that we started to have with the Dean just before we came in here this evening that, that frontline nurses can feel very remote and very distant from the global health uh, ag agenda. Um, and one of the things that we try and do at ICN is to absolutely show the connection, the golden thread that runs from frontline nursing practice through to uh, global health policy decision making. These are the publication that says free to download. These are just three case studies that are in this, this year's. Rachel's House is a, a paediatric palliative care service in Indonesia. It was set up in Jakarta over 10 years ago. The cost of hospital, uh, the, the average um, salary uh, in Jakarta is around uh, two or three dollars a a day and hospital care and treatment is just simply unaffordable for very many. Nurses set up a palliative care service for children who were suffering from cancer uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, these nurses traded their uniforms for crash helmets and got on their motorbikes and went round uh, to provide support to children who were suffering from cancer and their, and their families. That service uh, has now spread throughout uh, Indonesia, um, but it's also recognised as uh, providing excellence in palliative, home-based palliative care uh, for children, and it was a uh, nurse-led uh, service. The picture to the right, the lady in the uh, orange top is uh, called Cindy, and she works in the Australian um, out back. Um, this is a, a community where they see uh, a doctor 
perhaps once every three months. The, 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 the only healthcare professional uh, is Cindy, and she provides a huge one-stop shop range of services from first contact care through to uh, support for people with NCDs, mental health support and public health advice and, inf and, and, and information. Um, and critically, if you read that case study as well, she is trusted by the community. She has been able to support changes in attitudes to health and well-being because she is seen as somebody who comes from the community and is trusted by the community. The slide at the bottom is, Thomas, you'll have to help me out here because it's the hospital which is just down the road from where we are here, Telgarth. Telgarth. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and Shirley uh, isn't in this picture, but Shirley is the advanced nurse practitioner um, who uh, established uh, the service um, at this hospital because she recognised, and I, she was at the Nursing Now launch that I was, had the privilege to, attend, to, to attend a few weeks ago. Um, she identified that um, number of patients coming into A&E with chest pain was over 10%. It was creating problems in terms of um, uh, admissions and uh, bed occupancy, but also people having to wait uh, in corridors uh, for, ad for admission and she made the case for an advanced practice nurse and an advanced and a nurse-led assessment unit to see patients who came in with uh, with chest pain um, it's proved to be highly successful I think it was something like 36 percent reduction in trolley weights another very big reduction I can't remember exactly the figure for admission into hospital they did some work to compare the outcomes with other comparable units because some people were nervous well if this was a nurse-led service would it be unsafe would the outcomes be uh, be worse and it's comparable and as a result of that she made the business case to employ another advanced practice nurse and to extend uh, extend the service. What, what runs through all of these, um, and this is just a, it's a selection, it's about, they are nurse-led service services. Many of them are in non-typical settings, uh, are in remote, rural, uh, community-based uh, settings. They run from first contact through to chronic disease. Uh, the outcomes are proved to be highly uh, effective. Many of the nurses are making the business case for further investment in these as well. And nurses working at the top of their scope or advanced practice is also common uh, to many of these case, case studies. Um, the role of advanced practice uh, nurses or advanced nursing, nursing roles, um, I think, is one area where we really want to push ahead harder over the course of 2020 and take the opportunity that 2020 brings uh, to demonstrate the value, the effectiveness of advanced roles. This slide is um, uh, just a summary from uh, a recent report commissioned by the WISH uh, Foundation on um, the, it was a rapid and uh, evidence-based review on uh, advanced practice nurses and it, and it demonstrated uh, their safety in terms of managing patients with chronic conditions, outcomes as good as physicians, improved patient satisfaction, um, the, the preventative work that they were doing, that they were trusted, but they were both care and cost effective uh, as, as well in increasing independence and person-centred person centered care. Um, there are still... There are still barriers, uh, both whether that be regulatory, whether it be education, whether it be attitudinal to nurses working at vast and extended roles. But this work that has been some of the, uh, the, the research on the effectiveness of these roles, plus the case studies, I think that we're seeing um, uh, a real interest in, in from service providers and from um, policy makers but also politicians at looking at how they can develop new service models which will be based and built around advanced practice nurses. We were able, as a, uh, uh, some work which I haven't included in the presentation, but was a, a WHO review of non-communicable diseases that Annette Kennedy sat on as a commissioner. Um, and that report, in that report, contains some very, very strong statements about looking to develop NCD um, models of care in the future. The, 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 the norm would be that they would be nurse-led uh, uh, services. So this is um, 
We go back to W. We go back to WHO and the the announcement that we had um, just a couple of weeks ago in terms of the the year of the nurse and the midwife. And this picture was taken uh, moments, an hour after that announcement was made at the World Health uh, Assembly. Um, and I, I I include it just because the this is a picture of not all but many of the nurses who were in WHO and at the World Assem Health Assembly two weeks ago, speaking on behalf of nursing, participating inside events, involved in working with WHO on uh, a report that's going to be published next year called State of the World's Nursing, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. And this picture includes Elizabeth Iro is there in the middle, Baroness Watkins is just to her left, who is one of the co-chairs of the Nursing Now campaign. But within this group, there are chief, there are government chief nurses, there are educators, there are regulators, there are leaders of nursing associations from countries as well. Uh, there are younger uh, nurses. Um, and there are a few more experienced folk in there as, 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 as well. Um, but these are, these are faces of real-life nurses from a range of disciplines and specialities and backgrounds and countries who, who were, as I say, two weeks ago working with WHO. And the picture at the bottom, um, this is again... Um, uh, uh, it was, six months, it was six months ago, it was the meeting that uh, the Annette had with Dr. Tedros, but um, this was significant for me in terms of who the Director General pulled into that meeting. So the person on the very far left-hand side is Jim Campbell, who's the Director of Workforce at WH, uh, WHO. Next to him and between Dr. Tedros is Dr. Tedros' new deputy, who's Susanna Jacob, who until recently has been the Director General for the European uh, region, and then you can see uh, Elizabeth Aros uh, there in the picture, and uh, the other woman in the picture is Carrie, who's leading the State of the World's nursing work. But when we're meeting with WHO, it's, it, it feels more than just uh, going and meet the Director General, and he ticks his box that he's seen the nurses. This is we had the Chief Nurse, we had um, we had the Director for Workforce, we had his Operations uh, Manager as, as 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 well. So it feels as though we're making progress in terms of going more deeply, integrating more deeply into the work of WHO. This is, a, uh, this is just a, a, an overview of, of what next year is starting to, starting to look like. Um, of course, we're, we're, gonna work, we're working with, um, with nursing now to try and make sure that um, at the beginning of the year, um, you know all of those leaders of governments and nations and religions who make New Year's statements. Um, we're going to see if we can get a few of them to recognise in their New Year messages that it will be the year of the nurse, uh, the year of the nurse and the, and, and the midwife. Um, uh, but clearly we've got International Nurses Day, which will be a big focus of attention on the 12th of, of May. Um, next year it falls just a few days before the World Health Assembly. Um, and we have what are called triad meetings. This is where WHO bring in uh, chief government um, nursing and midwifery offices. We bring in associations. Regulators come in as well. And there are a whole series of nursing-specific meetings before the World Health Assembly. I think they will be, they will be bigger meetings than um, the plan is to have those much bigger meetings than we have had um, before and in previous years. Um, they will also uh, occur at about the same time that a new report called State of the World's Nursing is going to be published. The exact date for that has yet to be determined. Um, but this will be a very, this is a, this is a report, this is a publication, this is a hard product that will come out next year. You may be familiar with the fact that there has been a State of the World's midwifery. There's been two or three, two I think, State of the World's midwifery reports which are... Um, which described the state of midwifery around the world and looking at the numbers, numbers of midwives, shortages, education, regulation, but also do a comparison with the supply and then the demand for midwifery services. We've never had anything like that for nursing. I think one of the reasons is because it's a tough old job to do, to produce a report like that. 
Um, but WHO have committed to having that report. A group has been set up to lead it. Um, WHO are chairing it, Nursing Now are co-chairing it, and ICN are the other co-chairs. And there will be some very significant academic partners um, who are going to be doing a lot of the detailed work around that report. That report um, uh, uh, won't be perfect um, because it's, it's difficult to get the data. But we won't have had anything like it before, so it will be a start. I think it will be a very good start. But what I think it will enable us to do, it will be as much about the policy questions that the data identifies and the discussions and the debates that it takes us to as it will be about the data. So, so yes, have we got en enough nurses? Where are they coming from? Are we regulating? Should we be regulating advanced, advanced practice? Where's the investment in CP? What are the service models that are emerging around the, around the world as well? This will be a report that we can take into country advocacy and policy dialogue. ICN have got a big conference, advanced nursing practice conference in September of next year. And in November uh, of next year, sorry, October of next year, there will be a big conference in London being organised by the Florence Nightingale um, Foundation based in London um, to, to start to close out the celebrations for next year. There will be a lot more, there will be many more events and celebrations that countries uh, will, be, uh, will, be, will be putting on, but this is just a, a taster for some of the issues that, um, uh, and some of the events that we'll see for, uh, that we'll see for next year. My time is, um, is wrapping up, I know, and I just want to say a couple of things about nursing workforce, ICN's agenda. As I said, it's about health policy, it's about professional practice, um, it's about education and regulation, but it's also about the health and well-being of the nursing workforce. There is a predicted shortage of 18 million healthcare workers by 2030. Nurses comprise half of that, 9 million. Uh, it's huge, but that's a number, that's not a number that, you, that ICN has come up with, that's a number that comes out of a United Nations uh, re, uh, report. Um, so there is, of course, a huge effort in terms of education and training and recruiting uh, more nurses, but there is as much work to do to retain the nurses that we already have. Uh, and these issues in this slide here uh, show you just, you'll be very familiar with you, but you'll be, uh, these are the issues which constantly rise uh, by our association of nurses about um, the, the frustrations, the challenges, the demands and the pressures at work, but what could be done to what needs to be done to address some of those. Um, there was a very significant report published last week um, at, the same, at the same time as the Women Deliver conference happened in Canada on gender equity uh, within nursing. 70 to 80 percent of the health workforce are women, 20 to 25 percent are in leadership positions. The rest of the report uh, very powerfully sets out the, the statistics that demonstrate the inequities that exist, but it also includes some very strong recommendations about what needs to be done um, to address some of those things, whether it be leadership training and development, whether it be really serious child and family care support working practices and policies as, as well. There's a very big piece around pay levels. ICN has produced a report to show how around the world nursing salaries almost, you could see them flatline during the period of the economic downturn, the global, uh, the global, global crisis. Um, did, we manage to, did we manage to make any impact on those issues and the global health agenda? Last year was the 40th anniversary of the Alma-Ata Declaration. Um, but it was called, it's now called the Astana Declaration because the new declaration uh, was announced in Astana, uh, not in Alma-Ata. This is text taken from that declaration. That declaration says an awful lot of important things about public health and health education and prevention, but it also talks directly to decent work, fair compens comp compensation, not uh, 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 non-exploitative recruitment and migration policies and the importance of investing in education and training. And the final thing that I wanted to, to just to highlight with you in terms of ICN's role um, and the voice that we have and something which feels increasingly important to, uh, to me uh, is that as a profession uh, we have a voice 
in relation to rights issues and to the social justice agenda. This picture was of an ambulance that was in Syria, and you can see the bullet holes in that ambulance, and it was taken to the UN last year and put outside a UN building to very powerfully make the point that we are seeing around the world cases of healthcare staff and healthcare facilities deliberately being targeted as part of military uh, strategies, and that violates all UN and human rights conventions that we, uh, that we know. And ICN spoke out about this uh, because nurses and other healthcare professionals are being targeted and being, being killed. Um, but we also spoke out about it because it fundamentally undermines the principles on which our profession is based. Our codes of practice contain principles around respecting the right of individuals, the right to health care, non-discrimination and equality as, as well. This is a difficult line to walk. This is not about politicising our profession and it's not about being a renter quote and it's not about becoming um, politicised. Uh, but it's equally not about standing by and not speaking out when we see some of these uh, when we see some of these atrocities. A very practical thing that ICN also does, it has a fund called the Girl Education Fund where we, it's a foundation for ICN which supports children who have been, who've, have been orphaned but whose parents were, were, nurse, uh, were, uh, were nurses. So, final, final slide. Uh, here's, here's Florence getting ready for her birthday celebrations, the 200th next, 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 next year. Well, the other lady on here you may not be so familiar with, um, you might be Ethel Bedford Fenwick, is the founder of, IC, uh, of ICN. You know what Florence did for our profession. What Ethel did was not only to have the foresight to set up ICN, uh, she led the case for regulation in the UK and she was a suffragette. And when I look at these two particular women, uh, and what they championed, what they campaigned for, what they're known for from innovations in practice, the use of statistics, challenging medical hierarchies, setting up regulation, recognising the importance of international co collaboration and fighting for the right for the, the vote. I can trace back and see the relevance of what ICN does now to, uh, to our founders and back through our our history. In seven days' time, we start our Congress in Singapore, and if I've whetted your appetite and you're not already booked to come, I'd love to see you, uh, to see you there as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Howard, for a very insightful presentation. And it's lovely to see how nurses and midwives are being interwoven into the fabric of the, the global health agenda uh, and getting a seat at the, at the policy table. I think that's a very important factor for all of us to consider. So I'm going to move on um, and introduce um, Ashleen Kulnam. Ashleen is a General Secretary of Horatio. The European Psychiatric Nurses Association represents psychiatric and mental health nursing organisations within Europe. Ashleen is the Research and Development Advisor for the Psychiatric Nurses Association of Ireland. She has extensive experience in mental health and works in de on developing structural liaisons and networks within national and international bodies and is an executive member of the Irish Institute of Mental Health Nursing. Ashling is also a fellow of the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery in the Royal College of Surgeons. Thank you, Ashling. Good evening and thank you for such a warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be joining you this evening, um, both as friends and colleagues and indeed collaborators. Um, President, Dean, Executive Director, members of the Board and the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends. Um, when I come to this topic, it's quite difficult for such a broad subject such as policy and mental health to kind of combine it in um, 30 minutes, no pressure. Uh, but I always think when communicating around the issue of mental health, it can be complex. And sometimes I think, to bring it down to its basic terms, a story is sometimes most impactful in actually connecting and relating to something. So if you allow me, I'm just going to take a slightly different approach and introduce you the story of Alex. 
Alex is a nine-year-old boy from Dublin who was fostered over a year ago into a family in rural Ireland in the Midlands. There's an active GA presence in the area, with hurling the predominant sport of choice. And Alex attends a small tree teacher school, which is divided in across the three areas, which is low babies, high babies, first class, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. That's significant. He's a, he is in third class, but he struggles in school. But he recently articulated to his foster mother that he's going to die. His foster mother is a mature lady who is also caring for her 23-year-old son. The home was located in a rural area, and he was referred by a GP to CAMS, which is Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, with query, articulating a death wish, being disruptive in school, poor sleep pattern, query pain in his left leg, with no apparent physical cause for same. He presents to the service accompanied by his foster mother, and in preparation for his appointment, his social worker prepares an accompanying report. As is the usual initial assessment process in CAMS, two members of the team speak with Alex and his foster mother. Alex meets with clinical nurse specialist Paula. Interestingly, um, picking up on where Howard is coming from, Paula is working her way towards advanced practice in nursing. Aside from that, we'll come back to that in a second, he presents as a pale, quiet and reluctant to engage with Nurse Paula. And after some time in attempting to chat, Paula asks him to join her in the large group room where there is Lego, figurines and other toys. The room's large enough to give them both space and Paula sits quietly in another part of the room while Alex examines and explores the Lego and other items. He sets about creating a fortress with the Lego, and after a while, Paula returns, chatting about his work. Nearby lies a figurine of Frodo Baggins, Lord of the Rings. Luckily, Paula's familiar with this work, and she's familiar with the book, and again attempts to engage with Alex. Alex responds to chat by assuring the, assuming the persona of Frodo, telling Paula why Frodo feels sad. And while he continues to build his fortress, Paula notices that while the fortress is starting to emerge, the process in doing so is really taking quite a period of time. She slips away and calls her other nurse colleague to observe him in the two-way mirror, which takes up one wall of the group room. Alex, slow to engage, he, doesn't articulate through, he does articulate through the persona of Frodo, um, and he's, he said that he is sad, and time passes. But he doesn't appear to want to leave the room, and he's willing to play in the room. And Paula concludes the session and asks Alex, is he willing to return? And he agrees. Paula and the team members regroup after the family leave to bring together their assessment, and these are the key issues reported. Alex is the eldest of three children born to his biological mother who lives in Dublin. She is reported to have a drug and alcohol addiction, and all her children have been placed into foster care. The first and third child have the same biological father and are fostered together in Dublin. Her partner lives sometimes in the home. Alex's father is absent and there has been no contact with him. Alex's two brothers have the same biological father, so not the same as Alex. The eldest of the three brothers has been diagnosed with genetic condition juvenile Huntington's disease. With the last two years, he, um, the eldest has been displaying symptoms mostly of an impaired gait, but um, sometimes a little bit jerking movement, and he's been given a preliminary light introduction to the issue. Foster mum has articulated a lot of difficulty with Alex in the home by being withdrawn with quick flashes of anger, lashing out and storming out of school at home, and foster mum believes she cannot leave him alone with her son. She also says he is slagged in school because he has a Dublin accent and his avoidance of sport, preferring his own company away from the hurling pitch. Back to clinical nurse specialist Paula, she's observed through her initial assessment a lonely sad boy who's confused with little attachment to his current living situation, referring to his brothers and conversing through the persona of Frodo Baggins. In essence, he has built his own virtual world in which to live. But he has agreed to return, and Paula would like to refer him for an occupational therapy assessment based on his school report and her observation at the initial assessment. On visit two, Alex meets Paula, and he's quite reluctant to communicate, but agree agrees to go play with the Lego and return to the group, which Paula agrees. And the conversation again is conducted through the persona of Frodo Baggins. Paula is hoping to delve a little further into the peace of Alex's family and understanding of his situation and that of his brothers. 
He's forthcoming and Paula suggests that the occupational therapist and she would like to visit him in school. So Cindy and Paula arrive to school a week later where they find Alex out of the class, busily lining the pitch with the principal for the forthcoming match. In the classroom, they find him very slow at organising his books in a kind of a laboured way and indeed similarly in terms of following his lessons. And Cindy decides to, express, to, to assess him for dyspraxia. Paula continues her commitment to see him weekly dealing with his worries. And they continue, she continues to visit every Tuesday and begins to look forward to his appointments, albeit Paula states he's communicating through Frodo. At one of the sessions, in an effort to break the cycle, Paula offers to teach Alex the board game drafts. And Alex's ability to pick up the principles of the game and his concentration skills and that bring the two of them a little closer to talk about his sad feelings and his anger feelings. But he does pick up the principles of the game. And this new approach of playing drafts does bring the two of them together to have that more frank exchange of thoughts and feelings. He's also continuing his assessment with Cindy for dyspraxia, but the family placement is deteriorating rapidly. Alex, a social worker, contacts Paula, and Paula reciprocates. But Alex continues to visit his brothers and mother to organise access visits throughout all of this period. But as is often the case, the situation deteriorates when he returns home um, to his foster parents. So what has Paula discerned at this point four weeks after his assessment? Alex has articulated the following at the Frodo draft visits. He wants to return to Dublin to be with his brothers. He's aware his brother is ill and wonders, is he dying? He continues to complain about the pain in his leg. His brother's physical condition has begun to manifest itself with an unusual gait. He wants to be with his mum. He doesn't like his dad, and by this he means his mother's partner. He does not appear to know that his biological father is different to that of his brothers, and he's wondering, will he die also? Critically, he has said he, he, critically, he has not said he wants to die. In other words, he has not expressed a death wish. Um, but moving on, Alex is diagnosed with dyspraxia, and he will need assistance in class with regard to resources, special needs assistance, etc. And Paula has relayed this to the school. However, events are escalating, and Alex's foster placement is now in jeopardy following an incident at the home. So a social worker intervenes, and a decision is made for Alex to return to Dublin, care of a children's residential unit just for the interim. Paul is concerned at the amount of change for Alex at this point because uh, he's experiencing a lot at the one time. And uh, an uncommon request arranges that Alex can continue his anxiety management sessions in the Midlands even though he's living in Dublin for a short period. It's also important for the purposes of him moving to another school that his report on dyspraxia is taken into consideration in terms of supporting him. And a decision is also made to have a family conference to discuss what mum um, with mum that he has a different biological father to that of his brothers. Paula also believes rather that the pain that Alex has experienced in his leg is psychosomatic. He either believes that he has the same difficulty as his brother or else he's doing so to avoid hurling which he believes he's useless at. So Paula suspects that witnessing his brother's physical deterioration may also contribute to that. I can tell you that Alex remained in the children's residential unit for eight months after he moved to Dublin. He continued to attend Paula in that period, working on tools and techniques to deal with his worries and anxieties. And the subject of his brother's illness and support required for his whole family was central to a series of case conferences and issues that subsequently were planned. Alex was placed at another foster home in Dublin, near the park which according to the last report given to Paula was actually working out. Alex wrote, wrote a short few notes to Paula up to later that year. I'm telling Alex a story because I watched to share the human experience of relationships. To be in a human, authentic relationship, to truly discern and trace the pattern and cycle of Alex's journey. I'm describing the careful dialogue and the negotiations even between Alex, Paula and the other collaborators. But at the same time, I'm calling out the range of institutions, services and systems that had failed Alex at such a young age. Another objective of my sharing this story with you is to recognise the individual nature of the person's experience with mental health problems and to highlight the range of purposes that the mental health services might serve in supporting people. In moments of crisis, 
People struggling with mental health problems turn to services not just for a diagnosis or support in developing capabilities, but for sanctuary to alleviate suffering, to make sense of what has happened, to grieve, to recover, to rekindle hope, even if it's true drafts and Lord of the Rings. The title of this evening's discussion is Health Policy and Nursing, Local, National and International. And I have described the therapeutic relationship between Alex and Paula to support the argument that health policy, local or global, must take account of the human component and condition, as well as the population health perspective. It must have relevance and currency, not merely presented towards the pursuit of generalised outcomes for the population. It must not lose sight of the individual. When well conceptualised, the mental health policy can define both a vision for improving mental health for the individuals seeking the service and can reduce the burden of mental disorders in population. Mental health policy allows the expression of an organised and coherent set of values, principles and objectives to achieve the vision and establish a model of action. And to achieve a common vision from such a diverse range of stakeholders is not an easy task as different stakeholders such as family, representative, consumers, professionals interpret population mental health needs in various different ways. However, the process of establishing a vision allows for discussion, sharing of ideas, stakeholders, helps negotiate boundaries and defines a general image of mental health. It is essential that policy and planning is based on reliable information, as Howard alluded to, about available mental health resources and epidemiological profiles of mental health problems in that country. The policy must allow for merging mix of multiple strategies to be formulated and carried out in real time. WHO believe having a health policy on mental health is widely seen as fundamental to the task of raising awareness, securing resources which in turn are necessary to develop and deliver effective, equitable and affordable treatment. A national policy can obviously provide the framework within which to coordinate those actions across multiple agencies and sectors that one would hope would be in place to respond to the multiple needs of people with mental problems, if we consider Alex. European national policy makes broader agree on core objectives that their health systems must pursue. The list is strikingly straightforward. Universal access for all citizens, effective care for better health outcomes, efficient use of resources, high quality services and responsiveness to patient concern. Interestingly, the founding of Horatio, European Psychiatric Nurses, came from a perspective that in the context of policy making and service delivery with possibly agreed objectives um, and an agreed voice of psychiatric mental health nurse was absent from European policy level and indeed underrepresented in many countries at national policy level despite psychiatric mental health nurses being the largest group of professionals delivering mental health care. All over Europe there are nurses engaged in the care and treatment of people who have mental health difficulties. The changes sought and delivered in mental health care are carried forward on the energies of those nurses and an essential part of being a professional that one not only provides those services but ardently seeks to improve them. And while we have a duty to provide the best care for our clients, we also have a responsibility to influence those that determine how services are provided. The founding members of Horatio saw the value of a united approach to influence and shape policy, to advocate for our clients and lead the improvement of services and conditions for those who suffer from forms of mental health problems. To transmit that new knowledge or review and discuss new policies and principles of interest, to bring together psychiatric nursing representatives, to further the application of the most recent knowledge and to foster common action on priority issues. In 2004, with a number of like-minded mental health nurses from Malta and Holland, Des Kavner, the former General Secretary of the PNA, himself a fellow of the RCSI, joined in the process of building Horatio, the organisation for mental health nurses across Europe. The movement came in response to an established view back in 2005, and indeed now, that mental disorders are highly prevalent in Europe and impose a major burden on individuals, society and the economy. Mental health problems are also a key reason for losses of product human, productive human capital due to their association with high ra rates of presenteeism and absenteeism, which represents a significant share of the EU's burden of disability. 
WHO singled out mental health nurses as a primary means of combating psychiatric morbidity. Three years earlier, in 2000, in the Munich Declaration, they also advised that nurses should be central to mental health services because they could tackle public health challenges. So this was a small step, but a giant one for all of us. Because in May 2005, those nurses who met combined to submit a response and comment to the EU Green Paper on Mental Health and give feedback to the EU Commission. The Green Paper was launched shortly after the WHO conference in Helsinki and sought to initiate a public consultation on how better to tackle mental illness and promote mental well-being in the EU and to examine how best to develop a comprehensive EU strategy on mental health. It identified four areas of priority. But the debate sparked by the Green Paper led to a process that resulted in the launching of a European Pact for Mental Health and Wellbeing in 2008. And the establishment of the Joint Action on Mental Health and Wellbeing under the EU Health Programme in 2012. The Joint Action for Mental Health and Wellbeing, which started its work in 2013 and involved 25 member states as well as Iceland and Norway, showed that significant advances had already taken place in Europe in public mental health. Many countries had developed or initiated some type of mental health reform in the past few decades, and most countries' psychiatric services had gone on, undergone some transformation. Nonetheless, important challenges remain to be effectively addressed. In order to respond to these challenges, the Framework for Action on Mental Health and Wellbeing, launched in Brussels in 2016, defined five main objectives, aligned with the priorities previously defined by the WHO. And those areas for action were identified namely as prevention of depression and suicide, mental health in youth and education, mental health in workplace settings, mental health of older people, and combating stigma and social exclusion. In order to support mem member states in reviewing their policies and sharing their experiences to improve policy efficiency and effectiveness through innovative approaches while taking into account specific needs at local, regional and national level, the Framework for Action also included general and specific recommendations for each objective, both for the individual member states and the EU Commission. And with this in mind, the Commission established the EU Compass for Action on Mental Health and Wellbeing in order to create a mechanism for the dissemination of the policy recommendations resulting from the joint action and to promote the exchange of information on implementation activities and good practices among member states. The EU Compass provides member states as well as stakeholders with an opportunity to share their annual reports about their activities on mental health, the reasons behind the activities, the progress made in their implementation and the achievements resulting from them. In addition, the EU Compass collaborated with EU groups and governmental experts on mental health and wellbeing and non-governmental stakeholders in the preparation of four scientific papers. Twelve years after its inception, Horatio participated at all of these events including contributing to the four scientific papers which looked at accessing mental health care in Europe, prevention of depression and promotion of resilience, mental health in the workplace in Europe and community-based mental health services. The last report was published in 2018. It was only in 2006 in Prague that Horatio was established and currently we have a representative of 22 countries involved in various joint activities. New members have demonstrated inspiring input in the association and their energy is more welcome to strengthen the current developments and help the association connect stakeholders in various international projects. At the inaugural two-day founding congress in Arnhem, participants and invited presenters were asked, if you don't mind, to earn harness your energy, knowledge and experiences of the 350,000 psychiatric nursing professionals within Europe and the EU and ensure our voice is heard. I won't read the rest of it, but uh, it also basically was coaxing in leaders, theorists, activists to work in a networking, promoting, collaborative way. This all happened in Arnhem, interesting enough. I was there, actually, at the time, and it was a privilege. I can see, actually, Angela, my colleague, who was also there at the time, to watch this um, organisation emerge. And literally, I just watched and sat back. But for your information, Horatio now 
European Psychiatric Nurses aspires to be the voice of psychiatric nursing in Europe by uniting the workforce in pursuit of high standards, best practice, and ensuring recognition of the value and importance of the role of psychiatric nurses in mental health care. Horatio is the official European Association for National Psychiatric Nursing Organisations and Psychiatric Nurses in Mental Health Services across Europe. But just in case you were wondering why it's called Horatio, Horatio, the name is taken from Shakespeare's Hamlet, a figure who is a constant support to the prince, a troubled man. Horatio is present through most of the major scenes of the play. He is often in scenes that are usually as soliloquies and is honest and forthright in his arguments back to the king. Back in 2006, the thinking surrounding the name Horatio, the one person Hamlet confided in, who served him with emotional support, rationality and unwavering loyalty, in ways epitomised the psychiatric nurse, helping others to achieve their, dis their potential despite all the odds. I do want to just briefly allude to the burden of disease in terms of mental health um, and I'm just going to quickly run through some of these slides because um, it's a bit late in the evening for some of this. But, um, but the burden of mental health problems in Europe is very high, both in terms of morbidity and mortality. But the economic burden, too, is significant. And estimates in 2015 put forward that total costs related to mental ill health are more than 4% of GDP, or over 600 billion across the 28 EU countries. By country, the estimated prevalence of mental health disorders is highest actually in Finland, the Netherlands, France and Ireland, with rates of 18.5% or more of the population with at least one disorder, and it's actually lowest in Romania, Bulgaria and Poland, with rates of less than 15% of the population. But that has many reasons, one of which could be um, due to the fact that people live in countries with greater awareness and less stigma associated with mental illness, as well as easier access to mental health services, may be diagnosed more easily or may be more likely to report uh, mental ill health. Um, just in terms of um, the piece with regard to um, health problems, and in spending on the provision of mental health services. It's estimated to have accounted for about 13% of health spending across EU countries in 2015. This equals 1.3% of GDP, or around Euro, uh, 194 billion of euros of direct health care spending on a broad range of mental health conditions. This spending reaches an estimated 1.4% of GDP in Germany and the United Kingdom, but at the lower end, in addition to Luxembourg at 0.8% and Ireland at 0.9%, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Romania and the Slovak Republic are all estimated to have spent less than 1% of GDP on direct health care services for mental health. Ireland estimates spending on health as a percentage of GPP is 7.1%, the European level is 9.6% and Switzerland is 12.5%. These next couple of slides are just in terms of pictorials, um, without going into all of the detail, of where Horatio has influenced policy in terms of mental health care since its inception. This particular slide is in relation to a signatory of a joint statement on mental health for the EU health policy platform. Um, this was hosted by Mental Health Europe in wishing to see a concerted effort to follow on from that framework that I explained to you earlier um, to support mental health policies. In terms of working together, um, we also, this is actually the report from the um, Special Rapporteur, uh, which for the first time actually in 2010 made, and 2018 made a huge statement in respect of the mental health piece. And out of that, it's a huge lobby piece for us to build our other policies towards. This other slide here is in relation to working together. And recently, Horatio um, was involved in a consensus document, actually, working towards an effective and influential mental health workforce. It's the first statement in which mental health nurses, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, physios, and occupational therapists worked in mental health to establish this kind of cooperation. Uh, WHO were also invited all the stakeholders to participate in this, and work is now moving on in terms of the next key parts to that particular document. Boosting impact of, sorry, I went back there. There we are.
boosting the impact of mental health policies and services for European people, communities and economies, joint statements to invest in mental health research and European implementation partnership on mental health being, and being, becoming a signatory of the joint letter endorsed by the UN Special Rapporteur and the right of everyone to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health is a key part to this Roma research project, which we are obviously um, collaborating with in terms of values pieces and capabilities for looking at where we're moving towards in terms of our mental health piece. The next slide provides a conceptual framework of what I believe are key factors for associations like Horatio and the ICN. They provide information delivery in global platforms, increasing networks and connections with national, regional and international nursing and non-nursing organisations. I'm going to use a couple of examples to illustrate the components as I go through that particular framework, referring in part to Horatio's contribution to such an approach. If we take the piece there that's mentioned in the, the top, Department is identity, and if we look at aligning around common principles, is a large part of what an organisation of the future is all about. Members making decisions under defined rules of engagements, collaborating to create value, and earning the credibility to lead rather than having leadership be imposed on high from them. Organisations like Horatio reach higher when their energies are channeled towards a higher purpose because different people find inspiration from different sources. That particular picture was taken recently, um, and I'll come to it towards the end of the presentation, where we were visiting um, an art centre, which actually was a former psychiatric hospital in Denmark, and this is one of the pieces that the clients kindly allowed me to take a photo of. I just thought it epitomised identity very well. And if we, if it, if Cultivating purpose in response to member organisation needs sharpens our sense of mission and strength and keeps us connected to the intended direction and vision of our organisation. I am therefore pleased to refer to a recent development with ICN for collaboration between both organisations. We have recently signed a memorandum of understanding which sets the terms and understanding between Horatio European Psychiatric Nurses and the International Counselling of Nurses concerning cooperation in international activity in relation to mental health nursing. This MOU is intended to assist and support both Horatio and the ICN in performing their individual functions and to maximise effectiveness and efficiency, but in particular it will note interests of potential cooperation and collaboration in the interest of the advancement of nursing knowledge and the presence worldwide of a respected nursing profession and a competent and satisfied nursing workforce. It will support the work of psychiatric nurses' educational initiatives, mental health-related research, liaison with other national and international mental health groups, but the approach offers the opportunity to identify key issues for nurses which may or will impact mental health care across all levels of care and community. It will look at following trends and look at disseminating each other's work in the agreed areas of interest, optimising the key nursing nursing voice that Howard referred to in areas of policy and strategy. In recent years, the concepts and language of partnership, coordination, localism and safe services tailored to individual needs have set the directions for service reform. However, translating these concepts into practice has been a major challenge in part because of lack of administrative and financial structures to integrate services, but a lack of emergent, agile st strategies to simultaneously address matters such as housing, employment and education. Even when policies are laid out, they may not actually be implemented due to the failure of governance structures to engage with the realities with the mental health sector. By entering into constructive dialogue with service users, personnel, partners and funding. If we consider the case of Alex and reflect on the six cross-cutting departments which were responsible for his care, we had GP, primary care, we had social care, fostering, we had social care residential, education and CAMS. One cannot but have confirmed the importance of integrated decision making to respond and, and serve the interests of the individual. If we take the, the, back to the triangle again, the concept of agility. The concept of agility enables the shift towards emergent strategy, with an emphasis towards holistic, multi-sectorial, multi-dimensional, evidence-based approach that can tap into a network of people. It involves choosing the foundational elements, the structures, the governance arrangements, the process, 
This platform, in turn, supports looser, more dynamic elements that can be adopted quickly into the face of new challenges and opportunities to meet the needs of the stakeholders and those seeking care. Cross-cutting, interconnected choices, cross-functional decisions bring together multiple parties who often have different priorities so they can provide the right input at the right time within the policy. By engaging with a broad range of partners, our members, stakeholders and perspectives, we as an organisation can provide strategic leadership to advance the nursing profession to meet current and future needs of the population and the profession. Finally, in order to be truly person-centred and pursue the agility that makes performance possible, policy and organisations like Horacio and the ICN are likely going to have to fill some serious capability gaps along the way. Howard referred to this towards the end of his presentation. And it not just talks about the capability of the workforce, but the capability of the organisation to respond to the issues therein. Holistic approaches create the conditions for organisations to be self-managing and individuals to adapt. The challenge of reforming mental health services and creating community-based mental health care cascades to all aspects of the system. We can learn about mental health care from other countries and organisations, but we can also reflect on the diversity of societies in general and the challenge to implement and sustain change in such different contexts. In much of Europe, despite the profession increasingly becoming all graduate, the amount of specialist mental health training for nursing is limited, with only a handful of countries having specialist training at the level of initial qualification, whilst others provide only limited access to post-registration courses. The priority given to workforce development can be judged by the proportion of training hours dedicated to mental health. Responding to its mandate, Horatio has most recently embarked on two initiatives, but I'm going to just refer to one um, for the purposes of explaining this in terms of the slides. So I want to talk about the Czech Republic. So if, if we look at the Czech Republic, and the slide up there gives you a concept of the capital, the population, the expenditure on health, and it based on the health insurance system. Compared to other EU countries, mental health care is severely underfunded at 3.5% of the overall health budget. The process of reform in the Czech Republic started in 2013, and the Ministry of Health signed the strategy of psychiatric care. This strategy is a core document because it contains main principles and goals and describes necessary changes into the future. And there are many projects regarding this reform with different aims and focuses. These projects are actually funded from the EU. They include deinstitutionalisation, multidisciplinary cooperation, new services, information structure and support, destigmatisation. Not a small order by any stretch of the imagination. And the, the Czech Republic established an international advisory group to help them through this process. The international advisory group formed, is under the stream of deinstitutionalisation, and that project aims to contribute to changing the system of providing care for mentally ill from an institutional model to a community model. The project focuses on major steps, which are the quality of care, creation of regional networks, transformation of psychiatric hospitals, and awareness of the ongoing changes. They expect to finish this project in 2021. But if we look at the specific part of the project, which focuses on psychiatric hospitals and their transformation, the activities um, are focused on supporting the transformation of existing psychiatric hospitals and the creation of regional networks for the mentally ill. The structure of the Psychiatric Care Czech Republic, you can see here, at as it stands, um, there is 20 psychiatric hospitals, or sanatoria as they are called, with 9,467 beds. There are 31 psychiatric wards within the acute hospital setting, which has 1,383 beds, and they have what they call ambulatory care of 825 outpatient clinics, which is a component of community care. The structure of, the psych of psychiatric care is as I've laid out there, but you can see there's a complete absence of community care. And if you look at the length of stay, um, and the average length of stay is 84 days in care. Um, in terms of the wards, it's 20, it's, 22, it's 20 days. And they also have the pleasure of 825 psychiatrists to work on the lack of services. Um, if you look at the comparator of where the history of this um, 
uh, provision comes from, it's very much uh, medical based, um, which is fine, but if you look at the comparator of where the psychiatrists are working and where the nurses are working, you'll see that, and the purple on the left and the right hand side to you rather, um, that the majority of nurses are working in the psychiatric hospitals, which are the sanatoria, and very few are working in terms of ambulatory care or indeed out in the acute. So, what do they want us to look at? Well, the Czech Republic has invited Horacio onto the International Advisory Committee because they now need to look at the nurse education piece. If they are going to decant, and they're their words, the psychiatric hospitals, they are going to need a requirement for nurses that know what they're doing in terms of providing a community service. And if you take the training therein, it basically was a general nurse, and perhaps with 1.5 years I topped up on that in terms of a mental health piece. But equally, what they are looking for is specific competencies which will underpin their education because the, the education here to form was very much focused on the system, focused very much on inpatient care, focused very much on the institution. Um, and these are some of their wish lists, for want of a better word, in terms of psychiatric nurse competencies that they are um, looking at. These are the weaknesses which I just outline um, to you, just in terms of where they see the issue. And this is good because they acknowledge this is where the issues lie. But in terms of what they need, excuse me, um, they also need to look at the areas of practice. And they have identified that equally that the theory and that, that they provide is very much diagnosis and symptom approach, lack of a recovery approach, lack of self-reflection, and very much based in the, in the ward or in the institution. If we look at, indeed, the competencies versus the education for what they will need and what they have, this is basically where they're coming from. Um, and this is not us kind of talking down. These were actually shared to us to provide for to you this evening, and indeed I've, I've used these slides before, of looking at the process of what a mammoth journey this is going to be for the Czech Republic. Um, they have surveyed a number of nurses, took a quantum to see what was their opinion in terms of moving from this institutional care into the community. And when they surveyed those nurses back in 2016, they saw that 304 there was a sample, rather, of 304 nurses. Very, a lot of them felt very unprepared. Um, as you can see, only 11% felt fully prepared. So um, you can imagine where this is going to take us in terms of a complete culture and um, systems revolution, really. What they wish for is to feel emancipated, educated, experienced, able to work in a multidisciplinary team with good psychotherapeutic and communication skills. Um, they want an empathetic, supportive and flexible environment to be able to respond back to that. And I suppose in terms of um, just showing you a couple of kind of slides in terms of in that particular photograph to your right is the full group that are looking at the curriculum development piece. And on the left of that, there are also the various workshops with the various advisors coming in to look at the various training, not just for nursing, by the way, but we'll speak of nursing in the context of today's presentation. The former president of Horatio um, <coughs> is actually was nominated at the time. Martin Ward is his name, and he's actually moved on to other things. But he was our... And we, we have, he, obviously we have a race your representative, so the current president will be moving in, in shortly to kind of continue this work because there is an imperative um, with EU funding to move this project on. They have done huge work, to be fair. They have looked at their companies, their standards. They have taken a lot of knowledge from this jurisdiction, actually, and are very grateful for that in terms of looking at the standards and competencies for which they, w they wish to move forwards to. We, I won't, uh, the, the next slide is just to show you by way of, um, you can get these on the Horatio website. We recently issued um, a community mental health nursing position paper just gone in Denmark at our recent festival. Um, and this is in response to many countries coming asking about this whole concept of what is community mental health nursing. It is a short, very brief 
paper, really, in many ways, because it does support the movement towards recovery-orientated community mental health services, but it also needs to be contextualised in terms of the country to which you are. And if you go back to the Czech Republic, it comes from a very different culture and past, actually, to us, as do a lot of the Eastern European countries. And so we can't present a paper that's a catch-all for everybody. What we can do is look at the skills, knowledge, competencies for which we can prepare our mental health psychiatric nurses in the future, working towards those areas which require and come and collaborate when in, under the umbrella of Horatio. To conclude, as I've alluded to earlier, comparing mental health in various countries is a difficult enterprise uh, because of linguistic differences, differences in terminologies, different methods used in collecting and analysing data, different criteria against which efficiency of services are judged. Trying to understand whether services are well designed to work effectively is more difficult. WHO proposes 2022, 2020 rather, as the year of the nurse and midwife, and psychiatric mental health nursing must use this spotlight to celebrate its profession, address what needs to be done into the future of mental health reform and care delivery, from a policy, legislative and education perspective. The essence of Horatio must be grounded in how psychiatric mental health nursing drives policy that improves the health of people, health care and the profession. As a representative organisation, we call attention to the urgent need for robust, coordinated and transformative investments to address the escalating requirement for the supply of a competent, enabled and optimally organised mental health nursing workforce. The combined conceptual framework of person-centred identity, agility and capability provides for a collaborative, dynamic and relevant model for umbrella organisations like Horatio, which can endure into the future. We are a fledgling organisation in many ways. We have set a pace, though, in part, in being part of a community that stretches across the world and enables us to make vital contributions to global health issues through our future collaborations. Through our work with partners, stakeholders, and our recent collaboration with ICN, we intend to be visible, vocal, and harness our collective strength on a local, European, and global scale. That's the recent programme from our current festival, we have a history of having festivals every two years. We have a congress every year. We have a, um, a festival every two years, which brings that whole creative piece to the, um, to the, to the festival, which is actually over four days. It, it looks at other areas as well as the scientific piece. It looks at the creative, the collaborative, working with service users, working with, as I mentioned to you earlier, in terms of the crafts, working with musicality, working with those areas. And it is a vibrant, um, enthusiastic festival in many ways. It just happened to be in Denmark. We have been in Sweden. We've also been in Malta. We've been in Turkey. We've been in various places. But just to show you all of this serious work, we are capable of work and fun. Uh, I'll just leave you with a few photos from last month's festival held in Copenhagen, where Horatio, along with our colleagues in the Danish Mental Health Nurses Association, hosted four action-filled festival days of those critical papers, musicality, art and sport. But most of all, good company and commitment to do it all again next year. Um, so if you wish to join me, my pitch is to join us in Berlin in 2020.
Thank you. Thanks very much, Ashleen. I thought it was a, a, a really good way to, um, the case study was a really good way of illustrating the multifaceted nature um, of mental health nursing and also the, the need to incorporate the biopsychosocial model of care within that. Um, and I think it also highlighted the importance of having knowledgeable nurses, um, knowledgeable practitioners informing policy through Horatio. Um, and um, how that has impacted on not only the, the national um, but international and, and the global health and well-being of the, the, the patient who has um, a mental health disorder. I think it, um, it, your um, presentation was, was wonderful. So I'd like to invite Ashleen and Howard back to the stage and we'll have a question and answer session for about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm sure you've all got loads of, of, of questions for for both Howard and, and Ashling. <laughs> Do you, I, actually, we might bring it. Do we have a, a mic? Yeah. <laughs> So um, maybe I'll kick it off. <laughs> In terms of um, Howard, you were mentioning about the gender inequalities in, in relation to nursing and um, how do you think that um, gender inequalities is not only, only a nursing issue, but there's a lots of cultural aspects, you know, from an international aspect of, of, of nursing, you know, so how do you think that agenda can be put for, or can be forwarded um, through the ICN and, and the World Health Organization? Um, uh, uh, one of the things that we, we see in different, different countries um, are the different attitudes, the different images, the different perceptions, the different stereotypes of nursing profession. Um, and it's something that many countries ask us for help with uh, in terms of how they articulate and make the case for nursing in a way which reflects the value and the benefit of what nurses deliver. And I think I said in my presentation, there's a number of countries who, you know, and some, you know, and, and, and you don't have to go that far. You just go to Eastern Europe to see, um, you know, in some places, very strong still medical politics, medical dynamics, medical dominance as well, uh, which feeds through then into decisions about how care is delivered, investment in education and regulation, barriers in terms of extending scope. As, as, as well. Um, so there's something that we can do in terms of bringing uh, associations or nurses together in different parts of the world who've been down that path and are at different places on that path so that they can learn from each other. There's something that we can do in terms of, um, uh, of, 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 of helping to make the case for nursing, which is my opening pitch really about as an enabler. It's not for investment in in its own in its in its own sake, um, this and and there are some things that we do globally. Thinking about your what we do locally, what we do nationally, and what we do globally uh, as 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 well to expose where we have had to fight and argue for chief nursing officer posts, but there is already a medical officer, or there is a there is a nursing advisor that then reports to a medical officer and you ask the reasons for that and you have the explanation for it and say, so why does that not then apply to a chief medical officer who could, or a, a, a medical advisor who could then report to a chief nursing uh, officer as well? So there's, I think there's a, there's, a whole, there's a whole combination of issues in relation to exposing what's happening, what's going on, sharing, learning, calling out where there are inconsistencies, but then also making the case for what 
the profession can deliver in a, might be uncomfortable to say it, but when I, when I talk about the business case, um, that, 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 that we have to be a, we have to be able to you have to you have to be able to present that case at, 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 a, at a top table. Just one last thing that came out of that leadership report that I mentioned from last last week, which exposed a lot of really harsh statistics that won't be surprising to you. Leadership development was a key thing that, they, that nurses said that they wanted to help and support them to um, progress and to advance. And when we asked them what sort of leadership development, it's in the it's in, it's, it's in the report. They said how to advocate, how to make a business case, how to understand the policy development process, and how to understand political influence. And I just thought that was really interesting in terms of these were what nurses who, ex who are currently experiencing barriers, barriers to progression want to have the desire, the will, the ability to, to take on more senior roles. But this is what they were saying, that they felt that they needed to, 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 help, to help advance, which is a different set of skill sets than perhaps if you'd have written down on a piece of paper what you might have thought that was a few years ago. You might not have put those combination of things. In terms of the, the, the gender issue for nursing, we, we all know that 90% of, of nurses are, are, are female, you know, sort of, and that makes it. But it's not so much the case in um, mental health nursing. I think there's a... Um, an issue there in terms of what's been developed through Horizon. You know, um, sort of a newsflash. <laughs> 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 yeah. Females predominate in mental health nursing too. Oh, of, okay. not, um, and I can't tell you when exactly because I know certainly when I trained it was more male orientated, I have to be honest. But um, in Ireland actually it's predominated by the female profession. Oh. Um, now, that's Ireland. Mm -hmm. But again, taking where Harrods going, and if we look across, and we don't need to go too far, um, if I speak to my German colleagues, if I speak to some of my other colleagues, that's not the case, actually. It is the case in the UK as well. Uh, um, female side has, has, has come into it. But I suppose some of that is historical. That's, uh, that comes from where psychiatric asylums and workers and the whole historical piece of where the profession of psychiatric mental health nursing came from and it was male orientated if you consider in this country psychiatric um, hospitals were actually governed by the county councils so they weren't actually part of health at all and um, so that of itself brings you into a different space of the worker provider man piece and depending on where we are in terms of development or the journey of which mental health nursing is in a given country, you will see reference back to that particular um, era, if I want of a better word. So, um, so yes, um, in, in Ireland, we predominate as a female profession. I like to say that quite forcefully every now and then, um, just in case anybody is under any misdemeanors. But again, if we look at the historical context or if we check our colleagues in the Czech Republic, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Rory, you have a question? <coughs> Sorry. First year, uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there were so many issues, thank you both. Uh, be lovely um, to take on, but I can just take two perhaps. One specifically in relation to mental health practice in Europe, the possibility of Horatio looking at a common training framework or platform, or indeed whether one should, and that will be a, uh, maybe a, a negative thing for the future, but it, it could be a window of, of opportunity um, at the moment. But the other thing that's um, can continuing to worry me at the moment is a failure to really recognise at national level in all our nursing professions and midwifery is the impact of the differences in the scope of practice and the effect of culture and we're masking a lot of problems because we're failing to address that and we have rhetorics that are saying be better educated, be better this, be better that at the end of the day, the actual scope of practice of the nurse remains very constrained and very limited and threatens mobility, safety issues. So they were just kind of like two things. One, I see possibly an opportunity for mental health nursing. Mm. Um, whether people would go with that is another issue. I think there might be a window for it. 
and this other one of having to face hard on and head on the differences in culture and scope of practice um, in our professions. It's a very relevant point. Howard, do you have a comment on that? Um, we have uh, some advanced practice guidance which has been in development for a few months and which I hope we will have out towards the end of this year. Another plug for Congress, but uh, the chair of the ICN Advanced Practice Network, uh, Mel Haywood, is going to be presenting at Congress along with some people who've been involved in that work uh, to highlight um, yeah, where, we're, where we're heading and what that guidance might say. Uh, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion around advanced and specialist and how you express how you express those roles. Um, but the issue in relation to highlighting the barriers that stand in the way, and we 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 we've touched on a, on, on a number of them, and you're absolutely right. Um, those will also be part of the work because they need to be. They need to be called out as so to whether they're real, they're imaginary, they're historic, whether they're, whether they're protectionist from other areas, other areas as well. And that's why the, the work that I did show the wish there's you, you know there's, there's there's a lot of other research, um, and I think that there's for us there's something about making sure that where the research exists to to show safety, to show good outcomes, to show effective, to show effectiveness. That we absolutely bring that uh, we, we bring that forward. I think there's some work for us just around the labour market dynamics that you perhaps I perhaps wouldn't express it like this, depending if I was in different different audiences. But you know, uh, the GP shortage means that you've got to look at other in other areas. Um, if you're if you're if you're committed to universal healthcare coverage and increasing primary health health healthcare, you've got to look in other you've got to look in other ways to. You know, to do that as, as, as well. Um, I think it will be a big thing for 2020. I think I know that Nursing nursing Now and we, WHO, are keen to push hard uh, on advanced practice. So I think the next 12 to 18 I'm months. I'm actually thinking of the registration. Yes, yeah. That's where the biggest goal yeah, yeah. You can't build advanced practice on the infrastructure that actually has an important scope. Um, to answer your first question in respect of an opportunity to look at curriculum, um, an easy question. Um, so I mentioned that I was fledgling, naively walked into the bed of Horatio in 2006 and said, yeah, sure, we'll change the world. Great. Off we go. What do you want? Competencies? Yeah, no problem. Curriculums? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, and did I get a land? Because, you see, there's a certain degree of readiness to accept. There's a financial component to this, too. So if you take the Czech Republic, has EU funding behind deinstitutionalization, there's a readiness and a willingness. And, by the way, back to what we both spoke about in terms of policy and strategy, that was there, too. Now, if you go back to um, 2006, when I was in Arnhem, that wasn't ready in the Czech Republic. So quite frankly, you may as well have been, you know, going around with bits of graffiti, really, or confetti, in terms of talking about a competence framework. There were certain other things in place. Obviously, you had, you know, um, a breaking of the Eastern Bloc and the structures and all of that. But some of these changes take incremental steps. And, you know, um, I would have said, yes, some places are ready and willing, and they are, but other places are not there yet. I mean, we are in discussions with um, Slovakia. We have been in Cyprus, actually. And when I mentioned Malta, which is um, uh, considered actually quite advanced, it is under serious um, supervision with regard to psychiatric mental health nursing. It does have direct entry psychiatric nurse training, though, actually. But the, but, the, but the institution itself is not something that you would consider any concept towards community mental health nursing. So you see, 
the, the pieces have, of the jigsaw and the opportunities have to be ready in order for it to, to go in there. And, of course, leaders and champions and, you know, people who are willing and ready to do that. So the question always is, the balance is, we can bring, we can, we can share, we can do all of that, but readiness has to be there. And if it's not there, then um, we may have to just pause that button and come back at it a different way, um, to use that analogy, like the back of the scrum. Um, but... In terms of scopes of practice, then, and we go into that whole piece, um, and if you look in terms of labour workforce and what's ready in terms of um, in the, in mental health nursing, I mean, a huge proportion of workforce is unqualified, quite frankly, in the mental health work. I mean, we are quite privileged in this jurisdiction and others near us to have um, qualified labour workforce. So scope of practice in that space is a, is a very wide stretch to take. Um, and, and in so-called advanced areas, equally, there is this piece of the dynamic of multidisciplinary working actually isn't happening because what you have is a medically imposed model. And whilst you may actually have access to care, it may not be the type of holistic care that Alex needed, for instance. And where is the role of different professionals within that? So they're complex. I'm not attempting to try and, and look at it here this evening because I've learned over those years, um, not that it can't be done, but you do need the right ingredients for a lot of these things to manoeuvre and be ready. And part of that is being ready when the opportunity arises. Rory, you have a question. Uh, can I thank both speakers? Excellent presentations. Well done. I suppose a comment first of all, Ashling. I think there is something about the work that's gone on mental health over the last two to three decades that I think acute care can learn from. And, and particularly, it's great to see you're sharing that learning across other countries, but I think Ireland could learn from it, particularly linked with Slauncha Care. When you mm -hmm. think of the number of institutions that was in this country and the UK, actually from a mental health learning disabilities perspective, mm -hmm. and where we are now, it's gone through radical reform, which mm -hmm. probably is a pathway that we were sitting here in 10, 15 years' time, acute care will have to have gone through. And I suppose my next point is in relation to workforce, and, and colleagues in the room will be very aware of my concerns around workforce sustainability. And, you know, we rely heavily on an international and a European workforce, both, I mean, I spent many years in the UK, in the UK as well as here now. I'm very clear we're not training enough nurses mm. uh, and midwives. Um, I think the comment that came up at our Nursing Now launch in Drogheda, and it was made by Seamus Cowan, because we'd done a, a launch with both the faculty here and the RCSI in Bahrain um, and ourselves as a group. And, and one of the comments that came out of that was, should the countries that have more money be training more nurses to help out this worldwide issue of shortage of nurses and midwives across the world? And it, it, I know that might be a leap of faith too quickly, for some areas, but I suppose I'd be interested to see what the ICN's view is, because I appreciate this report's going to come out next year. Mm -hmm. I'd be very surprised if it doesn't confirm the fact we have a significant workforce issue in nursing and midwifery, uh, and we've got to do something pretty quickly to try and close that gap. But we'd just be interested in the view of actually that whole policy arena of trying to influence you know, the, those areas that can train more nurses. Cause Nursing is a great passport. We, we shouldn't see that in a negative way. I mean, nurses move all around the world. Some come back, some stay. You know, that actually isn't a bad thing. But, you know, I'm very clear in this country we need to be training more nurses. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and actually, um, the evidence I have would support that. So it would just be interested in view, really. Um, so, uh, just in terms of uh, global health workforce shortage dynamics, that those numbers that I gave, 9 million, it's huge, that's the number that's out there. Something that I think that we have to watch out for now is that there is a lot of discussion at WHO about new cadres uh, and about community health workers. There was a resolution on community health workers at the Assembly that being promoted quite strongly as a, an answer to uh, access and, debate and, 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 and availability. And there is absolutely a role for support worker roles for community health workers. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there isn't, but in terms of the education uh, piece, I, we need to watch out for the attraction of quicker, shorter, quick fix supply solutions to a registered nurse shortage. And that stuff is playing out now. Where it comes back to the education piece that I see 
internationally, and it also picks up a bit on yours, where are they going to where are they going to come from? When I was in the UK, I remember when I was in the Royal College, uh, making the argument for we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be workforce planning to land on you know the, the, the jumbo jet on the eye of a needle, which you won't do. We should be deliberately oversupplied. We should be deliberately training to oversupply because we never get it right. And actually, if there were more, were more nurses around the world, would that be a would that would that would that be a bad thing? I, I, uh, I, I think I, in the last few months I've had the the privilege to be with colleagues in the Philippines and India, which have traditionally historically have been suppliers of nurses and doctors to the world. They're both telling ICN that they're, uh, they're running into problem, uh, problems. Mm -hmm. India have introduced a great new universal healthcare coverage um, system, Modi Care, the um, Prime Minister who's, who's, who's brought back. That's great, but they're predicting that they need to go from something like 2 million nurses to 6 million. It's about those figures, they might not be good, but it's about those. Philippines saying that they're also hitting shortages because of their own health care needs as well. So relying on traditional places may not be a smart thing to do. Watch out for cheaper alternative supply. Should countries be doing more? Yes, they should. Also watch out for new models of education where private sector might think um, sorry, that sounds as well, I'm catching that in a way, it must be a bad thing, I'm not. But, but I know that, that uh, an international organisation like the World Bank, the access it has to funds and the work that it does for private sector development agencies might say, well, if countries, developed countries aren't doing it, let's set up a huge, great big training facility in a lower or middle income okay. country. That's happened with medicine. Medicine's making a fortune. So why would they not seem to do it? Well, I suppose, Howard, my point is, if nursing doesn't find the solution, yeah. someone else will. Yeah. And I suppose that's the role strategic policy makers have at local level, national level, and world level. Because we've seen it in other professions. I, you know, I've seen things happen within the UK system. So, so there is something about it's great with nursing and leadership roles at all levels. We must celebrate that. But if we don't take control of this, somebody else will. And, and actually, I think that's the bit that we're in positions to influence. And actually, if you don't do it pretty quickly, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and and the, when I said that the, the state of the world's nursing provide, will provide some labour labor market data, this is then, but it's the policy question, the policy questions, the policy discussion, the policy solutions that stem from it, which is the which is the, 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 the really the most important thing about that report. It is because it's your side to have that discussion now, and that's what will come on the back of yet yeah, a report which shows huge shortages and variations. What are the policy solutions and options to it? Uh, and the worry, uh, part of the worry, the other worry about those discussions is where our chief nursing officers are to be engaged and to influence those sorts of things, which should be part of the agenda. I'm also concerned then the report is whether it's going to end up saying that all nurses are oranges when we know they're not at the registration level. And that's, that's highly dangerous because we know it's not just an issue of downgrading registered nurses across the world, which is the next follow on from the expansion of the lower grades is demand transition <laughs> to the upper grade, um, which sort of goes into the, the historical cycle of the movement. And that, that's my worry is that we're going to have nurses describe that all the same origins. That sort of brings into the, the whole up. Um, discussion about regulation I and mean, we regulatory bodies throughout the world have different standards so therefore it, it, it becomes more difficult to um, register a nurse in another country you know so uh, that takes your point um, to another level you know when you're talking about regulatory bodies on, on top of it. On paper they could look the same. Yes of course yeah. yeah. Um, it's only when you start to do other work that you realise the difference. The other thing is that driving is the push for automatic recognition mm. in all sorts of ways. Um, and that's come from between the back door to higher education. Yes. Sure, thanks. Just to follow on from that, you talked about the state of the world's nursing report. I mean, how would countries, and I will say these big colleagues here, how, how would we contribute to that, say from an Irish or UK perspective? And will it be as Mary has said, will it be 
arms with versus oranges. I mean, will there be differentiation within the individual country reports of the state of the world nursing from their perspective? How is that going to look? Are there going to be chapters from a European perspective, or, or will it be all piggly piggly all thrown together? And, and how do people in the room here contribute to that message, get, get these key messages across to the village? So, so um, uh, the, the way in which WHO are currently collecting data is primarily through national workforce accounts, which is the standard election tool for labour market data that all countries should be using. My personal worry is that in some places, uh, in some countries, senior nurses, chief nurses, directors of nursing, at ministry at the level are closely connected. In other places, it's a workforce, it's workforce management. That data is being sought now and is being fed back into the WHO machine. So a very practical first answer is, who is the focal point for national workforce accounts in your country? Who is the person who is supplying data to, uh, to, to WHO? There are set indicators which they are reporting on, and the issue about whether that is being defined in the same way in different countries is a topic, is a topic for discussion now, because I think it will need, personally, I think it will need some sort of expert verification process when the data goes in to avoid the, the orange of the oranges situation. It's true on the databases in Europe, despite the great efforts by the EFF, the data is still being Uh, there is then a, there is then a, a steering group of who are overseeing who are, who are overseeing the process who I can help to make the connections uh, the connections with as well. The data in the country reports at the moment is still being decided, but it, 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 the model for the state was midwifery it was like a country by country by country report, which which had a you know this is what the profile of the workforce looked like in terms of supply, and then these are some of the demand the, the demand side issues. And I, that's what I'm hearing the approach they want to have for state of the world's uh, nurse. That's Hi, um, my name is Martin Dyke and I'm a, an advanced nurse practitioner. And just really for Ashley, um, I'm very interested in the World Health Organization's uh, uh, their view that mental health nurses are going to be are the untapped resource uh, for delivery of mental health care. Yet in this country, 22 years after the introduction of advanced practice, we have 23 registered advanced nurse practitioners on the psychiatric register. Um, so my question really is, is, is there a disconnect between the policy aspirations of our nursing leaders and the reality on the clinical floor? Um, and what are the barriers? Why, why, are we, why, do, we, why do we have so, so few uh, registered advanced nurse practitioners uh, in the psychiatric area? Very good. We actually have 50 percent more than we had about three years ago actually <laughs> we're feeling great at the moment um, but you're right in terms of looking at the um, policy and the connection between delivery and um, both from a national and european level there is a disconnect there's a disconnect in advanced practice in europe as well as um, obviously in this jurisdiction there is some of the problems that we can look at in respect to that are what colleagues spoke about in terms of scope and um, boundaries power um, and equally within that, um, there has been a conversation and there continues to be a conversation about what is a psychiatric nurse, an advanced psychiatric nurse. In some places um, you will say people are, well I did CBT therapy so I should be an advanced nurse practitioner, but that's not actually the case. It's how do you fold the practice of nursing into the, the piece of where you, the therapy piece arrives. And in that, that dialogue goes around in circles at times and saying, well, actually, from a resource perspective now, sure, I'll employ a clinic nurse specialist instead or a staff nurse that has those skills and we don't need the advanced nurse practitioner at all. Um, so speaking as somebody who spends most of her time arguing, which is why I have a sore throat, I think, for the last six months, and looking at percentages... <laughs> percentages of advanced nurse practitioners. I think we are moving eventually, but it was a joke, quite frankly, up until about two years ago, actually 2016. And in part of, from a local perspective, um, the industrial dispute that the PNA embarked on in 2016 looked for a percentage of psychiatric nursing to be awarded at advanced practice. That was one 
one of our asks as part of an industrial dispute. Now, my view is you shouldn't have to go into the industrial relations really in a, or the Labour Court to ground 23 psychiatric nurses at advanced practice level. But if that's what it takes, then that's what we'll do. But you can see in terms of where policy in a national level, and I'm talking about this jurisdiction, speaks to the great vision and speaks to the implementation of recovery orientated and community service when we know that in actual fact, while there are some very good practices out there, there are appalling areas in this country that do not have comprehensive community mental health services. They certainly don't have the psychiatric nursing workforce to plan what that great vision was or deliver it. And if we take case in point, Alex here, when Alex presented at that point, that was a comprehensive CAM service. I can, I'm sorry to say that it actually has just improved since the day of Alex, um, because in terms of where are going to be, the resource issue continues to be a problem. Today in this country, there are 700 psychiatric nurse vacancies alone in this country, in this country right now. Now, we make up a very small proportion of nurses in this country. If you take the register, I think we average about 4,000, just give or take. So if you take that we have 700 vacancies at RPN level in this country right now, we have, as Rory says, a chronic wake-up time problem to see how we are going to deliver this great vision policy that I spent the last 20 minutes talking about. <laughs> but again, it goes back to um, the, the piece about there, there are movable pieces in this. You have to be ready. You have to be ready for the piece when you step into that. Um, and if you take it at a local level, and I'm going to go back to what I know best, in 2016, when, when we were moving towards action on recruitment and retention, we were ready to say, you know what, you had this commission in nursing in this country in 1998, and you have 12 AMPs, thanks very much. What are we at? And that's when you call it out. That's when you have to move. So the policy is there sitting there, 1998, nice blue thing, um, and there we are with 12 AMPs we were at that time. So now the policy in this country is to move towards advanced practice, as you know. The Department of Health has put a huge input into um, looking at changing the rhetoric and moving towards that. But again, it's a case of having things in play at the right time. I'm, I'm hopeful we'll be building towards this, and obviously from your perspective, that's your passion. And indeed, if we go towards, um, I, I think it was in Rotterdam, wasn't it, the ICN advanced practice uh, conference last year. Huge learning is learnt within that. But if we are looking at a refresh of policy, which we are in this country at the moment, we need to look at the role of advanced practitioners in the refresh. And that requires dialogue, and that requires collaborators at the table, and sometimes it requires people being, as Rory would say, disorganised disorganisers to try and, you know, bring out those conversations. So your point is well made. Thanks. I'm, I'm loath to start with the debate, so we'll take one more um, question, but I, I know that catering is outside <laughs> waiting for us to... OK, to, sorry to, to yeah, my it's, it's really an observation I wanted to make. Uh, the educational standard is quite high to get into psychiatric nursing. So has it been looked at that you may have an introductory course maybe for two years before you would actually go into train as a psychiatric nurse? I just think it might alleviate the shortage. It's just an observation, so thanks. Um, my understanding, I stand to be corrected because I don't take account, but we don't have a problem with people applying to do psychiatric nursing in this country. Uh, we have a problem retaining them, all right, but we don't have a problem with people who wish to go into the profession. And interestingly, that's not the case across Europe. You hear this in terms of um, it's not the profession to be in. So I, I, I kind of was taken aback in that naive space some years ago when I realised like, you don't want to be in this do you not? Um, but actually, you're quite right. In, in many areas, this is not the profession that people choose to when they think about nursing. That's not the case here, actually. In, in, the, in the case here, is we have no problem with people applying, but um, we have a problem retaining them. Um, so back to the conversation about horses for courses. What is the best way or the opportunity or the ingredients ready to deal with the, the nursing shortage in the context of your area? Um, so that is back to not one size is going to fit all for all of this across Europe or indeed other jurisdictions. Um, in this jurisdiction, um, we, we could open as many places as we like, but the, firstly, that comes at a cost to the Exchequer. Secondly, we don't seem to be able to manage to retain them because they all head off to New Zealand, UK, 
Canada. Um, and thirdly, in terms of respect of um, introductory courses, etc., that may be something that could be looked at in some areas. But I'm mindful, and it's in the back of my head, is that um, when we look at situations about approaching professionalism, etc., we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater under any respect. And psychiatric nursing has had quite a fight to get recognition as a profession within the nursing profession. So in terms of holding standards and sharing, like our colleagues in the Czech Republic, we do very well in this country. They are very happy to have that. But they are also will, will remind me that, Ashling, you know, we might be quite ready for some of that just yet. We just have to, you know, trot slowly maybe in some parts of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to finish by um, presenting both Howard and Ashley. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and Ashley. Thank you very much indeed.